Uh, okay, thank you very much uh, for coming to the session. And um, it's a thrill to be talking about financial history. I just thought this might be a backwater for most people, but uh, I'm going to try and convince you that financial history has been um, central to uh, the development of modern financial economics. But more importantly, since this is a session that has to do uh, with research to ideas, um, that uh, I'd, I'd rather talk less about just stuff that I've done and more about directions that uh, financial history can uh, can take us and and uh, you might have some uh, interests that get sparked by this. And and uh, so that's really more of the point of this is to to generate uh, and <clears throat> stimulate um, uh, curiosity and interest about the about this field. Uh, here's a plan of what I had thought to talk about. Um, I want to talk about at first some of the big um, things that financial history, some of the big uh, impacts that it's had uh, in our economy and, and in uh, theory and so forth. Then a lot of my personal work has been on long-term estimation of risk and return with financial data. Um, I like, I, I started out my career before I was a finance professor. I, I was an archaeologist right when I got out of college and I loved digging up old stuff. I mean, I liked it regardless of what we could learn from it. I just liked to dig up old data and then you can see that if you know some of the, some of my work. Uh, and then there'll be some work on innovation, um, and, uh, and why the study of uh, financial history is also the study of change and innovation and, and so forth. So let me start with the motivation. Uh, this is a quote from Ben Bernanke um, in his Essays on the Great Depression. And since not all, all of you are going to be able to read all the type, let me just read it. <clears throat> uh, uh, ben Bernanke says, my 1983 paper was among the first to explore the possible, the possible macroeconomic implications of financial crises. So he is a financial historian that found himself in a historical moment in time, but he was armed with the knowledge and the tools uh, to, um, to navigate us through this financial crisis. And so, um, you know, we can owe the whole um, – the whole idea about uh, why the financial crisis was um, was was important and how and, and it was a, it was his chance to try and put some of that financial um, historical knowledge to practice uh, in a big way in a global way. Um, now, um, I want to talk a little bit about my colleague Andrew Metrick's uh, recent work. So Andrew went to go work for Treasury during the financial crisis. So he, like many of, of probably some of you, uh, you know, financial crisis was an opportunity to say, "Look, I want to do, I want to help and see whether I can help sort things out. What can economic uh, know-how, uh, <clears throat> uh, how it can be put to use?" Same thing during COVID. I know a lot of us suddenly stopped in our tracks and said, we have some some empirical skills, uh, some theoretical skills, empirical skills. You know, this is a chance for us to try and uh, help society. So uh, Andrew is my colleague at Yale, and um, he has, he was, he created a center on financial crises. And um, so uh, his approach to, for, for, you know, solving financial crises or being prepared for the next financial crisis is to go back through history and collect every um, in a, every um, instance that the government intervened uh, in a in a catastrophe or, or a crisis. And the idea, when when I say collect, um, he's had a team of researchers going through. And this is only a chart. I mean, let me just tell you, walk you through the timeline. But he's had a team of researchers writing cases. Uh, uh, coding the uh, financial events. And this thing goes back into the, um, well, it certainly goes back into the 1200s, um, their research. And uh, then they've got um, all these various instances, like here is the financial crisis of uh, 1720, um, when the first global stock market bubble uh, then burst. He's got all the interventions that uh, governments have uh, have conducted since then, 
And then the outcomes of those interventions. Sometimes there would be some monetary change, all sorts of ideas that have been put to use to, to solve a financial uh, crisis. So um, this is a database that you can go to. And so if you had some theories about, <clears throat> about uh, responses, the right responses to financial crises or conditional responses to financial crises, this is data that, uh, that at the Yale School of Management, <clears throat> Andrew Center maintains. Uh, he did this with Paul Schmelzing, who you may have heard of um, because Paul uh, reconstructed the history of interest rates from uh, from the Middle Ages forward and it, in great and rich detail to study. Um, you know, if you want to know, was the last were the last 40 years uh, the, the most dramatic decline in interest rates? Paul's the person that can answer that question. The answer is is tr- is right. Uh, it, it it was. It was an extraordinary moment in in financial history. So anyway, they have a paper that you can read about these interventions as well based on the data. But again, they get, they're giving it away freely with the hopes that some of you might be interested in this kind of research and you'll be the next Ben Bernanke um, when the next financial crisis comes. So since it may be just around the corner, you know, so don't don't waste any time. <clears throat> I have another wonderful colleague at Yale, so I'm going to brag on his work in financial history. Um, Gary Gorton um, is really one of the top thinkers about what banks are, Uh, a a wonderful theorist, but his early work was empirical. And I'm going to read his quote. You'll see on the right-hand side, he has a book. He published a wonderful book about explaining what the panic of 1907 was and the financial crisis, the the great um, global financial crisis. But then Gary says in this book, when I wrote my PhD thesis in the early 1980s about banking panics, I never dreamed that I would live through one. Who could possibly have imagined what would transpire? But you say banking panics, like the one in the movie It's a Wonderful Life, don't happen anymore. After all, the, the panics of the Great Depression are a dim memory. Okay, so that's his uh, prelude. You know, when you're one of the great things about financial history is if you want to study some really important things, you have to use history. There's just no way around it. How many times have we had these banking panics? Gary studied the ones in the 18th and 19th century, mostly in the early, early middle 19th century. That knowledge helped him understand that when everybody else was talking about the financial plumbing, if you will, in the financial crisis, he was able to identify what was really going on, the fundamentals of a banking panic. And that's the theory that he put forward about what the crisis was, but it derived from his really detailed study of banking panics. Okay, one more paper. This is a more recent paper by by Gary and uh, and Chase and Sharon Ross. Um, who are uh, Yale grads. Um, now, this is a paper in 2000, uh, 2022, and it's called Making Money. So it's got a catchy title. Um, but um, Gary, one of, other, one of his other really interesting works is to study the free banking era in the United States where every bank in the world seemed to be printing their own pieces of money. And like in, in New Haven, Connecticut, for example, uh, where, where uh, I'm from, there are, there must have been three or four banks in the 19th century that were printing different bills. And now multiply that times all the different country, all the different cities in the country. You can imagine the pandemonium. Okay. We've seen this recently. It's called an ICO market. Okay. Um, every uh, company thought that they could issue coins. Uh, people would pay real money to get the coins, get the magic beans. And then those things they could spend in a special context, and um, then maybe you'd get really rich if you had the right coin, okay? So what Gary's idea was, well, what he studied is he looked at the, at the prices of all these, all these monies around the country and found a very simple thing. The farther away you go from the issuing bank, the greater the discount, i.e., the haircut on this money. Why? Because... There was uncertainty about whether that bank was solvent. And if you weren't living nearby, you didn't know much about it. So it, what was create, what creates money? It's the informational, uh, characteristic. 
It's how much, uh, how much uncertainty you have. And his theory about, um, about, um, that divides assets between those that have to be researched because there's some risk that they'll fail versus safe assets that people don't bother about the research because they don't need to. That came, fundamentally came from his study of the 19th century. So uh, those are two wonderful, um, those are three wonderful examples of why we should um, consider financial history as an important um, element in our education, uh, you know, business education, uh, financial economics education, and so forth. Okay, now I'm going to skip to some of uh, the things that uh, have fascinated me over my entire career, and that is um, the measurement of financial asset returns. Um, you know, we, we're really um, lucky to have, uh, to, to be here in Chicago where CRISP was born, and the concern with, um, with creating a clean, uh, useful database of, uh, of security prices and dividends and so forth so that we could, we could do, um, um, reliable research, uh, about, uh, the performance of equities particularly. But, um, that's just a narrow sleeve in one country, in one asset class. And when you think about everything that people invest in in this world, you have to ask, how come we only have these few post holes of high quality data? My observation when I started working in this, this area is that, um, there are, area, there are errors of omission as well as commission. And if you're just looking in the corner where the light is and drawing inference about, um, uh, asset pricing, uh, about prices of assets, you're just, you're, you're in trouble. You may not be able to get, you, you may be getting the answer wrong. So, um, one of the things I've done through most of my career is try and collect messy data, imperfect data, data with gaps in it, data with where people have gotten the numbers screwed up and, uh, you know, it's a wonderful problem, but, um, you know, it's easy for a referee to say, let's reject the paper because the data is uh, dirty. OK, so that's got a that, that's a challenge. We're in a different information regime where we sort of know everything about everything. OK, um, more information may make it easier. You're right. May, more information could make it easier to, to have, um, these riskless securities. And so, uh, if you've ever dug your way through, um, through a, uh, uh, prosop for a mortgage-backed security issuance, those things 600 pages long, they tell you an enormous amount. But they're also systematically, they were systematically susceptible to a common risk shock just because it's disclosed, right? Doesn't mean that you can figure out the probabilities. So I'm sort of, uh, I, I buy your argument. And, uh, so it could be that, um, the idiosyncratic portion of the risk may be, uh, more easily, uh, dealt with than it was before. And the common source, we're all, we throw up our hands because we don't really know the magnitude that could strike us. Um, but, um, I think the basic into the, the basic theory, um, about, uh, about this salient point where you have to, uh, do more research and therefore you're going to, you know, take a haircut. I, I think that that certainly goes through. Um, if it's not stable coin, it's some other thing that says we're just like stable coin. So why not us? We get a better deal, you know, so. What I will say is that financial history really could help us address some of these questions, whether or not things are only rhyming or imitating the past. And so, um, well, let me say during the, um, uh, actually before the financial crisis, I had a project where I was looking at, um, uh, these mortgage backed securities. Actually, the big shop was just down on Michigan Avenue called the, the uh, Strauss company. And they were issuing, um, mortgages on individual, uh, skyscrapers. And that skyscrapers, you'd buy a bond and it had the name of this, like 44 Wall Street, actually. There's still an old bond from the you know, early 20th century. So that was an incredible financial innovation. It was a one um, property mortgage backed security. So three, 
competitive firms went into this. Um, one of the firms in particular uh, started to, uh, let's just call it a, a, a Ponzi scheme, which is when one of the bond, one of the bonds stopped uh, paying, they then supplemented it with uh, money raised for the next issue, and it was a complete disaster. And it was one of the first things that the brand new Securities and Exchange Commission took up as a problem. Uh, so that moment in time, actually, is an interesting one to study because those were some of the first <clears throat> big commercial mortgage-backed security securities. And it turned out that it changed um, uh, it changed the way regulators uh, thought. So anyway, whether we didn't have exactly the same thing going on, we had more residential. But it was useful to have that per, that perspective. And how frequently do these periods of, particularly in debt, how frequently are these periods, and what what is related to them, where the um, fixed income uh, values just drop, and the consequences? We, in order to study big things, like I said before, we have to go back through time, say, well, this has happened four or five times since the, since 1700. We better know what these are. Of course, now inflation. Everybody says, well, what happened in like the 70s and 80s? Let's go check that out. Then before the 80s, when was it? Well, that was the First World War. You know, we're stuck with very few instances, so we better make sure we find as many as we can. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you a chart which I have watched grow since – well, I guess certainly since 1990. And this is a chart um, that is called the Stocks, Bonds, Bills, and Inflation. And it all comes from an article that was written um, by Roger Ibbotson and Rex Singfeld when both of them were here in Chicago. And um, I have a little picture of, of, the, of the title down here of their original article, 1926 to 1974. And what Roger... Um, and Rex did is so simple, okay? They went and collected and calculated the total returns to an index, uh, to a passive index of large cap stocks and small cap stocks using crisp data, okay? And then also they had a way of calculating, they found a source for long-term government bonds, um, then uh, they uh, had treasury um, returns, and then they also had inflation. And then they just ran this analysis that uh, is, a, is a chart of cumulative returns without transactions and without taxes um, and showed this marching through time, and the spread between the stocks and the bonds just kept increasing. Okay, that didn't seem like rocket science, but when you think about this, when they were doing that in the uh, when they published in 1974, how many index funds were there in the country? Well, maybe Wells was fiddling around in the very early 70s a little bit with this. Vanguard really hadn't gotten cranked up to sell this to the public. The, and the looking at this chart and looking at the statistics that come from this chart is was a huge motivator for the whole growth of passive indexing. Um, because when you see that, you say, okay, uh, I know that if I invest in bonds, I'm giving up some level of historical excess return. And that's an easy one for anybody, for people who aren't financial economists, that's an easy one to understand why the equity risk premium uh, is beneficial and sort of how big it must have been. So I look at this as a real watershed in, in the practice of, of investment management. Um, and uh, so, as I said, every year, uh, Roger gives me another yearbook from SBBI. Sometimes some years are better than others, but here this is, this is through 2022. But um, this is our benchmark for the equity risk premium. Um, okay, so you know, that's in practice. Let's look in theory. Um, this spread between the stocks and the bonds didn't go unnoticed um, by uh, uh, by scholars, and uh, so uh, Mera and Prescott uh, had a you know many of you know the, the paper, uh, but it's all about 
the puzzle of why stocks beat bonds by so much. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, whatever, in 1985, I think it was. And, and so they p- proposed this as a puzzle. And, and it's a puzzle because the empirical evidence is inconsistent with the, um, the, the theories that we have about people's attitudes towards risk. And then spawn, that spawned a whole bunch of great ideas. Some of them may be true. All of them may be true. Doesn't matter. Um, the literature on the equity risk premium has, has been, you know, burgeoning of the whole, uh, has burgeoned since then. It's still, I don't know. From my view, it's still a puzzle. But, um, uh, Tom Wrights, uh, was the first person to propose that, well, maybe there really is a big shock around the corner and people are actually demanding a high rate of return in compensation for that shock. Okay. And, um, Bob Barrow, uh, and co-authors, um, have really developed that whole intuition and the, in the, in the technology behind that. But in addition, gathered a bunch of historical information to see whether they could test that idea. So Barrow's work, um, um, shows you just, uh, how much, uh, evidence there is in history that massive, uh, shocks may actually, historical shocks may have caused people to have views, uh, that required a higher expected rate of return for equities. So that's an interesting thing. And it comes, of course, from the study of the historical patterns and not just the mountain charts and how much money is being made, but also, um, how frequently these big shocks have happened in time and how frequently you might have to re- believe they will happen in the future. So all a dependence on history. Uh, um, the work that I did with Steve Brown and Stephen Ross t- takes a completely different tack. It says, um, you know, what we're looking at is when we look at the U.S. market, we look at the index that Roger Ibbotson, Ibbotson Sinkfeld created, it's all about the United States. What if we did it about a different country? Would it tell the same story? So that's, um, and so if we, we naturally, when we go and look for equity data and we want clean equity data, where do we go? We go where somebody's constructed a clean index of equities and there were lots of equities and it's reliable. We go to the U.S. data. Well, maybe U.S. was just not representative. So I'll, I'll go forward one slide. Here's something that Philippe Jory and I now 25 years ago um, constructed. But it, every little point here is a point uh, where we have uh, an estimate of the equity uh, premium. Uh, so in percent per uh, returns per year on the vertical axis and then years of existence on the horizontal axis. And, um, if you can't read it, this point right up here is the United States and it, and just below it is Sweden. And this is going back to, um, uh, uh, I, like 19, um, 21 or something like that. Um, if you go back a little bit further, which Elroy Dimson, Martian Staunton had gone back, Sweden gets on top sometimes, depending on time period is. I don't know what's something wonderful about Sweden, I guess. But um, what this tells you is if you focus on the United States and you're thinking about building a global equity portfolio and you ignore Spain, Japan, Belgium, France, Netherlands, Germany, UK, Canada, and then Switzerland for long ter- long-term uh, uh, indexes, you know, you may be uh, fooling yourself and the equity premium might just be much lower. So that was the, the proposition. And of course, then if you also think, well, I might be an emerging market investor in uh, Pakistan, Egypt, Uruguay, Argentina, those things we ought to not just throw out. We ought to consider when we're doing studies that that could be relevant to estimation of the equity premium. So Elroy, Dimson, Martian, Staunton and, and I and, and many others have been sort of sorting through this, trying to see can we be as comprehensive as possible and take into account going forward what was the investment opportunity set uh, uh, that that people um, uh, had. There are two things that could be going on. One is selection bias, just focusing on the United States. The other thing is, of course, inter- markets interrupted by disasters. 
those two things have to be happening at the same time. You don't have to believe that one is 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 to the exclusion of the other. So I think you're right to ask the question, which one sh do, should we buy one story or the other? I sort of think all of these things are, are relevant uh, perspectives on the equity premium and and to the extent that we use the equity premium to make forecasts on risk and return for um, in practice, um, we should consider those. It's maybe easier to go dig up a bunch of data for all these different markets, um, but the dog that didn't bark, the financial crisis that did not happen is another problem that we really need to study. Barrow's work is wonderful because he tries to, they try to go and find all of the disasters that may have occurred that we just didn't pay attention to because we're focused on a single market. So, yeah, I think uh, both of those. Mm -hmm. One kind of response to this is to, uh, uh, well, let me tell you a glib response. Maybe the United States will never get into a world war and lose it, and so then um, we can just, uh, you know, uh, be happy that somehow there's something special. Um, that, that's that's something you always have to worry about because that's the conditioning bias. Um, but um, in terms of how do you actually use the data in practice and the equity premium, theoretically, if everything is stationary in the economy, the equity premium, the more observations you have, the better off you're going to be. And then ensues the problem of is it stationary? I'm going to show you some. I hope I'll, I, I, I'm going to show you some data about that. You're saying, I have a hypothesis that the change in the reserve currency is something that may affect the uh, equity premium. And, of course, everybody now is thinking change in the reserve currency. Maybe China is uh, strategically trying to do that. And so maybe we should expect a shock to the equity risk premium that's semi-permanent. Those are great questions. And, and, and his, historically, we may be able to test that because you just said this. We have one great case uh, about uh, 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 with the U.K. So. I don't know what the answer is, but that's a great idea. Um, okay. Um, so here is data. This is just the picture from 41 different markets. Um, some of them are from Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton, and some of them are things, the data that Philippe, Jory, and I, Jory on and I collected. We put the two of them together, so it has both emerging markets and big markets. And here's the simple question. A lot of my work has just been arithmetic. Sometimes it's really addition and subtraction. Um, and so this is a simple question. Suppose the market goes up. Suppose a country's market goes up by 100% or more in one year in real terms. Okay. Now, you would say to yourself, we might be in a bubble. This is, I'm scared. I'm in a, how could you possibly have the, the market price go up by that much? Well, this is not an explanation for why it goes up. But then with historical data, uh, collected historical data over, um, in this case, it's over a century of data, what we're able to do is ask what happens after it goes up by more than 100%. And that's what this figure is. The, the uh, blue line um, is, the, uh, is the average return. And what you can see is, um, we condition on going up by more by 100% or more, and you see the blue line goes up by that much in one year. And then we say, what happens over five years? Um, does it come back down? You know, the the meme of what goes up must come down. You might think, well, it should revert back. Well, it turns out that when we do this experiment, it doesn't revert back. And you may also be saying, well, you're just looking at the survivors that survived five years after a big bubble. For that, what we did is we, uh, we, we followed forward using old journals, published uh, uh, old contemporaneous sources that listed, only listed the markets that were extant and investable at any given year. So we didn't backfill. So, cause that was a concern. So, um, Here's what happened. I mean, uh, 70 had, 70 of them had 100% boom or more. 11 of those 70, uh, declined by 50% in the next five years. Um, uh, but, uh, the great, uh, the, 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 the bulk of them, uh, went up. And 
basically what the evidence suggests is that once you had a huge return, actually that means you're also very volatile, uh, it was a coin flip whether it went down or up the next year. So uh, that made my um, that made my mother uh, feel pretty good about leaving her, uh, you know, not selling out in the in uh, in in COVID, you know, time. I said, just stick with it. I, pro- chances are you'll be okay. Uh, here's data. <clears throat> here's something that is the reverse of that. Suppose it goes down by a lot. Suppose it drops by 50 percent. And here we're using a much, much bigger database. We're using global financial data. And this is a, um, this is a, a remarkable project over many years to build um, a database of, of, of uh, all sorts of assets, but particularly rich in world equity markets. And uh, so uh, global financial uh, data allowed us to take a look at, well, certainly more than 100 markets uh, from 1690. So that goes back into the UK times. And, and we just t- took it up through uh, 2016. Again, simple arithmetic. What we're looking at is suppose that a market <coughs> declines by 50% in one year in real terms. That's this bar. What happens the next year? On average, it, it bounces back by about 17%. What happens if it goes down by only 20%? It doesn't bounce back so much. So there's something extreme going on. Um, when, some, when, when an extreme drop happens, we found some empirical evidence uh, to suggest there's a bounce back. Again, the problem here is um, whether or not we're just looking at the survivors and so then we also, I'm not going to show you another chart, but, um, the, this, the, the, um, the survivorship bias issue, um, we handled by looking at this follow forward market and treating zeros, treating markets that disappeared as a zero, going to zero. And uh, that result, um, seems to hold. Okay. Um, so, um, now I want to talk a little bit about um, some of my real passion for the 18th century and why you should think about doing some archival research that digs into really deep uh, printed and even handwritten material. But I'll tell you why we were interested in the world's first stock market bubble, which happened 1719 and 1720. There was um, stocks... We know that stocks began in, well, the story goes that the first stock market was in Amsterdam in 1602, so that they were began in, in the Netherlands. And then um, the next thing, the big event that you might remember is the South Sea bubble and the Mississippi bubble that happens in 1720. So many, many, you know, more than a century after the um uh, the, the, the creation of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, we had some dramatic dynamics that um, were global. When I say global, pan-Europe certainly. 27 different um, countries launched some form of, uh, of new equity investment. So equity investment, the idea of it just caught on like wildfire and spread from uh, from, from uh, the uh, well from London to Paris back to London again to Amsterdam and all the cities in Holland and to Germany and and so on. Uh, the the picture on the right is a is a book that we published at our International Center for Finance um, that is about this whole bubble and what we did is we got experts in many different disciplines to participate with us. So another thing about history historical research is you can't do it all yourself. If you're a financial economist, you're used to working with quantitative data. You need to think about where did the data come from? What was the context in which it was generated? Why did they decide to 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 to, to record this stuff? And then um, that's going to be very useful to you. So we got scholars, um, people that were experts in uh, in uh, literature and uh, and poetry and um, playwriting and uh, uh, printmaking and and we we got them all we asked them all to study this wonderful text um, that was printed right at the time that the right after the bubble blew up 
and when I say bubble, it was uh, uh, really huge. This is a picture uh, of the uh, South Sea bubble, and you can see the South Sea Company, and uh, this spans about, this really just spans a whole one year. So think of these as, as, uh, as this remarkable year in financial history. This green line represents the South Sea Company, which is a big financing scheme, but also never to be forgotten is that the South Sea Company was going up in value because it was a speculation on a company that had the right to uh, sell African slaves to Spain in the New World. So it's not this kind of amorphous idea of, oh, the Atlantic trade, which it was, but it was really uh, about one of the most egregious periods in, in human history. And it was a stock bubble. So anyway, here's the South Sea Company. But then what we did is we found that other companies were going up even more. And so um, what was causing them to go up? Well, some of them were insurance companies. Uh, and, uh, some of them actually, I don't have a lot of the small ones, but all sorts of innovations in, um, in, uh, not just trade, but uh, mechanical innovations and, and manufacturing, uh, ideas and, and, uh, so on. So this was a time in London, particularly, where the corporation suddenly got to be this hot new, um, mechanism for, uh, for doing all sorts of business that hadn't been done before. Well, how, you know, we've been living through that over the last couple of decades. You know, new things like, uh, uh, um, like, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a new form of doing business. Um, the, like I said, in, uh, initial coin offerings, um, and, and this, this technology that we're experiencing, and we've seen the feverish excitement that speculators have had about it. This was a, as much a bubble about allowing corporations to pursue anything they wanted to pursue. If they wanted to take a water company in London and turn it into a, a financing company uh, selling annuities, which they did, called the York uh, Water Company, York Buildings Water Company, then they did that. And they just did it without – without Parliament um, telling them they couldn't. Well, Parliament tells them they couldn't. And it happened right here, and Parliament passed a law saying, you have to ask permission to do to do the business that you want to do. You can't just willy-nilly do it. You have to ask permission, i.e., contribute to my campaign. And so then, well, it wasn't enforced, but suddenly the Treasury enforces this bubble act and the prices plummet. And it just is not only a plummeting in London prices, and this is something called the London Assurance Company. It also spread to other uh, countries. And here we have West Indies Company in the Netherlands, and we've got Rotterdam Company, and they're all plummeting at the same time. So it was a systemic uh, equity uh, crisis. That was not just because what goes up must come down, foolhardy speculators, because the regulators came in and said you can't use corporations to do all the businesses that you want. And then people lost interest in the stock market. The the Dutch experience was such that we only saw a few companies listed after this amazing year. It went from a whole bunch of new companies to these things not having any liquidity. Uh, the world turned against speculation. And uh, it, 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 uh, it impeded the use of equity markets for raising capital for about a century in, in European history. So, um, <clears throat> all right. Um, here is a picture. Now, this is getting into just a little bit of insider baseball, but I, I wanted to really focus on the origins of the corporation, understand why the corporation – is a particularly uh, particularly useful uh, technology that we have today, and when did it start? Question in the back. Well, first of all, some of the data that I got, that we got um, for the um, UK and for France came from Larry Neal, who is 
the I guess really the the, the dean of the uh, of financial uh, economics, the uh, history of finance, and he was the first person to collect high frequency data for a number of companies. We then supplemented that because we found um, we went back to London uh, newspapers and then made copies uh, uh, every day of prices of the companies like the insurance companies that he had not collected. So we just supplemented what Larry uh, did um, using, um, you know, the library. We requested it from the um, the library. Then they sent over Xerox copies to us. Then we typed these in. And, and I typed them in myself. It's really important that you get your hands dirty. Uh, so you, that's how you learn what the data actually mean. Like, you know, how do you know they're actual prices? Well, sometimes they're just spreads. Uh, it's not a price, it's a spread over the par value of the security. Our retrospective bias is, oh, well, I know what a price is. No, 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 you have to figure that out by looking at the data. So th so that's one thing. Um, and um, now, whoops, uh, I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself, but there's great, arch there's great uh, documented archival material. We also, um, we were really lucky because when we, there was no data about the Netherlands uh when we started this. And my co-author, Rick Freyan, uh, he combed through every library in the Netherlands until he found, I think in uh in Utrecht, uh a whole run of for that year and a little bit more of a newspaper that was called the Leitse Courant, Leiden. And then his father was a really pretty good uh amateur photographer. His father documented every page of, of that newspaper. It was published three times a week. So then that gave us not just the prices, but that also gave us all the articles where people were speculating about why the prices were moving up and down. And then that was helpful because they would talk about London. How do we, you know, why is it a global crisis? Because they're watching the markets in London and, and, and in trading on anticipation and getting out, trying to get their money out of London. So we were, that newspaper allowed us to actually follow that. So, um, I learned enough of how to, of reading old Dutch that I could know something's interesting. And then I'd ask my co-authors like, okay, what does this passage really mean? But that you have, you face language issues as well. Yeah. So a lot of interesting archival work that goes into that kind of picture. Um, okay, now I'm going to go even deeper, and I'm going to talk about the theory of the emergence of the corporation. So, um, you know, the um, <clears throat> Northern Wine Gas, uh, um, they launched uh, uh, the whole idea of new institutional economics, and a lot of that was around what was going on in the 16th century um, in uh, in London, the political uh, changes uh, in London um, that made possible uh, the emergence of a new financial economy, if you will, but um, a different uh, tr tr uh, institutions that fostered, um, among other things, uh, co commercial enterprise. And um, so the... Uh, the, the narrative about the emergence of the corporation foc has focused in most of our minds on the Dutch East India Company, that picture of the boat in 16, that, that, that picture of the boat, uh, the, the, the long distance trade, uh, uh, as the motivation for creating an organization that had perpetual, um, had perpetual capital because these voyages would last a long time. And also the need for a market where you could trade your shares because some people needed to get out of the, you know, some people needed liquidity and they couldn't wait for the boat to come back. So those are two things you say, well, this is how, um, how, how, uh, perpetual life of an organization and a stock market emerged. And then there's another story about how limited liability might have emerged, uh, not immediately, but as a, uh, as a way of sweetening, um, for investors, uh, sufficiently that they would commit their capital. So that's one story. Um, my co-authors, uh, Sebastian Pouget and David Labrice and I have, have challenged that with a counter example that um, is kind of a thorn in the side of this idea. 
And the way we, we did this was because, um, Sebastian and, um, and David both live in Toulouse and Toulouse has these fantastic notorial records, but also records of two, actually three companies that were created, um, that were, that emerged through, that were created through mergers in, uh, in, uh, 1372 and 1374. So just push the date of the corporation back. And, uh, so what were these? These were not ventures. These were not big risky things. They had some risk, but they were mill companies. They would take grain and they'd make flour. They'd, uh, and, and that's how they would generate their profits. The profits did fluctuate dramatically through time. The dividends were based upon the profits, how much grain, how much flour was generated, how much grain was milled. But crucially, what we were able to clearly document is that they had permanent capital. You didn't have to invent permanent capital. The laws allowed permanent capital. Uh, medieval laws, a uh, special set of laws allowed it. They had liquidity. We have records of, tra- of shares being sold, tra- uh, transactions all over the place, not on a daily basis, but we have um, these, these shares tr- uh, turned over like, well, more frequently than houses, let's say, today. Um, and here's the thing that we got very excited about. Um, the way that corporations uh, came into existence in each, in, in each case differed. In the Dutch example and in the English example, they were created by charter. In other words, uh, the government said, we allow you to have a company. And uh, your, your company is chartered. Um, the Toulouse case there was no need for a charter and it, these were corporations that were formed by contract the contracting and the rights of uh, and, the, and the and the rights to defend your contract in court were fairly well established so this the there was always a theory in the legal literature that you could form a cor- corporation by contract didn't need a charter we found an example we found two examples and have been studying them ever since because we have um wonderful records of their um uh, of their annual meetings and their boards of directors and their, their, their shareholders and how much the dividends were and so forth. Under the civil law that was an operational at this time, there was an organ, organizational form called a pariage, which had no termination, but it was a shared ownership structure that uh, did not allow you to, to split the asset but it allowed you to share the benefits of the asset. Andorra, the country, that's a periage, and it's been held in uh, by, by two entities since time since 12th, 13th century, I think. Interestingly enough, um, these had limited liability without having to establish it. And the way that worked is that um, the shares represented a, a basically a property right and um, that that un, a feudal property right and uh, the feudal property right could be handed back uh, to the Lord, let's say, and then you were done. The Lord just took the property right back. If you didn't meet your obligations, like defending the castle or something. Now, if you didn't like they were had, if there's a recapitalization and you didn't want to pay in, they took the shares back. So, all you could lose were your shares. They couldn't, the, the company couldn't come after you for anything more than that. So it was beautiful. It had li- another, all the checklists. They had a juridical entity. Uh, they had lawyers representing them. They had, they evolved by the 1500s to have a, a CEO kind of structure. They had external accounting, um, that reported the board. The board met once a year. They, there are rules about staggered boards. I mean, it's remarkable. All of this long before Dutch East India Company and English East India Company evolves into this form. So what's interesting is, first of all, nobody ever imitated those Toulouse companies. They didn't lead to a whole new industrial revolution. It was not this remarkable discovery that just changed the world of business. I mean, it's a pity, but it's interesting that that, that was not a necessary condition for the, a financial revolution. So that's what we would, we were arguing. It's kind of, a glum thing to say, you know, that uh, corporations didn't transform the world, but it's, that's what history tells you. 
The transformation of the, the world could have been transformed by the Dutch East India Company, English East India. That's fine. It may have happened, but it could be that instead corporations, the corporate form as a, an equilibrium, which is what these two represent. It's an equilibrium that could spring up spontaneously and it could be springing up other places. The contractual form that what makes that interesting is you can contract on different governance structures. You could contract, uh, on, uh, on, on uh, different kinds of shares. Very flexible. As long as you can get everybody to agree, they're all shareholders, which they did. They get them all in one room. And, uh, and yet the East India Company, it, you sort of depended all the time whether the state was going to renew your charter and, and so forth. I think it's great applying these insights to these DAOs and other things that are uh, uh, per, uh, so-called solutions. Maybe the maybe the next DAO is going to have by contract. So, you know, well, um, one of them died in the 19th century. Another one uh, survived very nicely. Became they both became Societe Anonyme. They were traded on the Paris Exchange. I've got an old share certificate from the Bazaco Company. Then that company lasted until 1949. Then I'm not. Dis I don't want to disparage France, but it was nationalized. Okay. Now the now the thing that we find out later is eventually they. they they privatized it. It became an electric company because the mills were churned by water. And so instead of mills, they were generating electricity. And now it's been uh, privatized, and you can now buy shares in this company that effectively goes has a legacy back to the 14th century. And if you ever visit the um, uh, Toulouse School of Economics, it's like right next door to that. So it's uh, well worth well worth seeing that. Uh, this is a picture of the of the of the 19th century building, but underneath that is the Gothic age structures that uh, that represent the foundations of the mill. All right, here you were asking about uh, how do we get into the archives. Um, well, here these are the coolest archives, almost the coolest archives I've gotten into. Um, on the left is the corporate document that created the Bazako company by merger, and it's written on like eight eight, eight uh, goat skins, if you will, and then um, it spells out all the rules of the game uh, so that that contract w made it um, uh, m made people willing to uh, uh, to participate. So um, incentive compatibility is what this document um, guaranteed. Not a promise of the government, but in incentive compatibility for all concerned. On the right hand side is a picture of the, of the registers that we were able to get, uh, from the mid of the 15th century on of every shareholder, every share, who bought it, uh, who sold it, when it happened. So Martin, uh, so market microstructure in the 15th century, 14th, 16th century, uh, you know, come to me to ask about it. Okay, uh, just a little bit more about what we did with this. Um, we, um, of course, I couldn't resist doing asset pricing. And uh, so what you're looking at here is the data that we have that go back into the 1500s, starting down here. And then um, we have two axes. Uh, one of them you can see goes up, goes up to sort of 600 to 800. The other axis goes up to 8,000. And so one of them is the price. These little dots will be the price, uh, of the, of the, uh, 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 of the stock. And the other one, well, let's see. Blue are the dividends and red are the prices. And I put a 20 year centered moving average through them to, well, to help your eye, but the statistical tests bear this out. We looked, estimated an asset pricing model to see if the prices anticipate in the short term changes in the dividends. So that's what you would expect if it was a kind of a rational asset pricing. Uh, 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 if, if people were rationally 
pricing the asset in anticipation of the future cash flows. And so uh, that that's one of our papers that we um, we published uh, and found evidence in favor of, of that very simple asset pricing model. Simple but rational. So people weren't stupid in the Middle Ages in the in the early modern period. Uh, they were pricing the the future dividend flow. And then there were of course catastrophes that happened. These breaks are catastrophes. And then if you were close enough to see it, there are sometimes there are just lines that are just flat like this where the stock price is not really chain different. They just used, uh, they, they had a sort of a level that they had fixated on, uh, like 4,000 as the quote unquote right price or, or our dividends were fixed there. Um, sometimes there's a, let me see, I think this is about a, the 3,000 level line for the share prices. So there was some kind of, um, fixation on, quote, unquote, the right price uh, that maybe ran a long way through time. That's a whole behavioral theory I'm not really going to get into. Uh, what's the long-term total rate of return for this survived company? I should say survived. I say survived, but it did disappear in 1949. And the price, you know, didn't get uh, fairly bought out. So it was a, and they paid them something. But anyway, long story short, you may want to know uh, what the long-term rate of return was over all of this time. And and um, uh, the best thing to do might be to use a dividend yield of about 5% uh, in real terms because we transformed it all into silver. So what's the equity premium? Well, if you want to use just the longest possible series where the whole economy changed, you know, from uh, milling grain to – electronics and uh, AI, you know, you're welcome to use that number. Okay, now I want to move forward into more research uh, ideas. Uh, so <clears throat> Melissa Dell has recently posted a remarkable data set. Oh, by the way, let me just preface this. You know, historians, their data, uh, what they use is text. And they've been do, making history for a long time, and mostly what they focus on is text, sometimes pictures. We're financial economists. Mostly what we've done is, is focus on numbers. But guess what? All of a sudden, the whole world of words and text is completely open to us, and we can we, we want to use this, and we're all using it, and we're getting excited about the things we're finding. But the tools that historians have developed for judging the qual, the, what the text can tell us and the incredible biases that emerge from why the text was created. That's something that we really have to keep close, uh, attention to. So Melissa Dell has, um, put, ha, has done OCR on the Library of Congress, um, collection of American newspapers and actually other newspapers as well. Um, and it goes, I think, up to 1950 or so. I, I don't recall exactly, but it goes back in time a long way. And she's got good methods for a quality OCR for this text. And this is something that you can use. So think of all the theories that you can test about financial crises and things that drive asset prices. And, and uh, uh, you know, it is a playground of great new data. Because after all, when we study efficient markets, what is an efficient market? Well, it's it's efficient conditional upon the information set that exists at a given time. That's what Eugene Fama tells us. Now we have so much more about the information set, we can really do some great testing. We don't have to just use yesterday's price and, and the dividend ratio and so on. So I am so excited by this. We haven't downloaded and touched it, but I'm, I just really encourage you to at least start taking a peek and see whether you can test some of your ideas with this data. I think one of the most exciting papers that uses this uh, kind of data, and now it's just, well, well this is by um, Asaf um, uh, Manella and, uh, um, and uh, Alan Morera. And Alan was, my, co was my, my colleague when he was writing this with Asaf, and it was fun to peek over his shoulder at what they're doing because they used um, wonderful machine learning methods on text that extends very far back in time. And basically what they did is they t tried to see if they could build a model where the Wall Street Journal front page, I think maybe even just headlines, could predict the fix. 
over the time period that the VIX exists, existed, and then they backcast it. And they said, well, if we get a good model in this period, maybe we could use the newspapers to go all the way back in time and figure out um, some correlate of the VIX. And then we can see, like, what are the things that push around uh, the prices? And then we, they do decompositions is what I'm sort of showing you. They find evidence that wars were really a big deal in terms of people's uh, 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 concerns in, uh, about uh, the big deal in predicting the VIX, therefore um, fears, okay? Uh, so um, a more recent paper uh, which um, uses a lot more and longer data series, uh, David Herschleifer and um, a couple of uh, uh, I would call them pretty serious computer science finance types uh, have been able to create a, a clean uh, data set that is quite uh, large, uh, uh, clean text data set. And here you can't see them, but there are word clouds that they're pulling out um, uh, over 160 years about what's moving stock markets around. And they get topics like war and panic and monetary standards and pandemic and real estate booms and, and boycotts and evil business ideas. And, and so now you're really getting much more behavioral stuff. So I, I urge you to take a look at that uh, because uh, this approach of, of topic modeling has been um, really helpful to help get us into the mind of what stock investors are concerned with. I'll show you a picture of some of my current research that is with Bob Schiller and Dossel Kim. Dossel is a, a researcher at the uh, OFR, and so I don't know what disclaimer he would put on this, but I'm just saying there's a government disclaimer, okay? Uh, now, what are we doing? In this picture, um, we've got the VIX, which is in red line here. And I want to make sure I get the dates right, but it goes, this is from 1990 to October 20. So sorry to be off screen a little bit, but, um, so over this time period, the red is the VIX popping up and down. Okay. Then we have something that comes from linguistics. Uh, uh, empirical linguistics. Um, Piper and Baga are two as a team of, of linguists who, um, who coded, uh, who, who took the, let's call it uh, Google Books, but we call it Hathi Trust, then um, took passages and had linguists code them according to certain five different features of what they believe is narrative. And Bob Schiller wrote this recent book. And I don't know how recent it is, but narrative economics. And so we took their coding and their model, and we said, let's see whether the, there are periods of high narrativity, storytelling, in the Wall Street Journal in articles about the stock market. And so um, what you see here in the blue line is when is storytelling narrative, things that are more like fiction as opposed to nonfiction, uh, when are they high and when are they low in the in the Wall Street Journal stock market articles? Uh, and so what you see is uh, a decent correlation, and I could and the and the key statistic on the correlate on the on the co movement is is uh, significant. Um, so uh, this is kind of an interesting exercise for us because we're trying to test some of Bob's theories about whether or not narratives. Um, are related to financial uh, distress, uncertainty, and, and crises. So that's where we are on using this uh, this this uh, natural uh, language processing and and uh, and uh, AI modeling to test um, a theory that Bob's really been writing about since the early to mid 1980s. Okay, I think uh, let me just. Uh, March on to some conclusions here. Um, financial history has been a huge, has had a huge impact on financial economics. As a matter of fact, and any of us that do empirical work, you know, that really is historical work. It just may not be that old, but longer, if you, if you want to focus on big ideas, you got to use very long-term data to encompass those big shocks. 
I showed you some of the work by colleagues uh, that really uh, learned from the history to, to explore why, uh, you know, ideas about cryptocurrency and so forth. But um, I think what you really uh, – I probably don't need to preach to you about this, but on the possibilities of using text and historical methods has just entered for us a new phase. And uh, the availability of this data, the, you know, the, the, the information set, at a given time is just extraordinary. And uh, so I think some of you are already, you've jumped in with both feet, I'm sure, but I think we're going to find really interesting things about what moves markets, uh, and for that matter, what uh, creates new uh, uh, corporate entities or business entities and so on. So I'm, I'm very excited about the possibilities of financial history and, and hope you are as well. Whenever I presented this paper, people spot this. This regime switch in 2016. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I mean, you can use your imagination about whether or not the narrative about everything, the narrative, the storytelling as opposed to the nonfiction um, uh, fraction in the in the news may have suddenly taken a turn. But we haven't tested that. I mean, I have tested for a regime switch, and there is one. So, but I haven't tested for why. And so, um, I'm, you know, I'm holding that at bay until I understand it better. You could use some institutional argument to say that, let's say, English-speaking countries are different than other countries because of law, or you know, that was the whole idea of LLSV, right? That uh, somehow. Um, that common law, you know, versus civil law really is a determinant that lasts for centuries. However, that didn't work out as well. When you go back in time, throw away the 20th century, what do you get? You may get it, you know, some scholars have shown you get a different answer. But nevertheless, it was a it was a hypothesis that they took seriously and tried to test. Um, one thing I just did not mention in here but is also an area of financial history is a tendency to use instruments that are uh, centuries old instruments. For example, distance from the printing press or a uh, degree of Confucianism in China. They're very creative ideas about using historical uh, instruments that somehow could are, are orthogonal to one thing, but capture another. Um, that's a, that's interesting. I just haven't done anything myself with it and haven't looked at it except to kind of admire the creativity involved. I'm probably the only professor in this room that's written a paper on the Dow theory that supports the hypothesis. Okay. I confess. You'll find it. It worked out of sample. Okay. Forget about the Ellie Wave theory. The, the Dow theory is, is better. We talk to legal scholars a lot. Um, we, uh, uh, the law is really essential to our theories about corporations. And, um, so, um, I could tell you about all sorts of interesting projects that we're involved in that, that really, um, are, uh, that rely a lot on understanding the legal milieu of when these, when organizations are like, we're, we're, we're interested in, in the companies that, uh, created all the polders. Why, well, how did they, how did the Dutch organize this big infrastructure project of draining polders and then creating organizations that lasted for centuries to keep the windmills turning and pump the water out? That's a big, interesting challenge. That's, nobody writes about that. Well, some people do, but it's not like the Dutch East India Company, uh, story. Yeah. Okay, I guess I better leave it at that. Thanks a lot for your ideas and suggestions.